in your line of work, you emphasize the importance of training coordination over isolated strength. Do you mind uh, elaborating this approach, I guess, for the audience being strength conditioning coaches that might be uh, perhaps following the more sort of traditional model um, of strength training and conditioning? Well, well, first you have to look at the traditional model and see what the weak point is. Um, the weak point, actually there's two things that are really weak point. Um, the first weak point that I saw that I uh, didn't want is that it's utopian, right? Classic, classic training. Because you find one, uh, let's say, uh, one, one approach with all the details in it that is not just plotting out what the benefits are of the training, but also plotting out what the negatives are. It's not there. They only plot out the positives, and that's utopian. Because mm -hmm. in dynamic systems body, it's such that if you want to improve one thing out of self protection, it will decrease something else, right? Something else will go backwards. What would be some of the negative adaptations to that traditional model of strength and power training uh, as examples that um, perhaps we're not seeing uh, as coaches or, or, or maybe athletes that are doing those practices might not be aware of the negative effects that are starting to outweigh the positive benefits of that type of training? Yeah, well, one of the, the most interesting things that we came across uh, is uh, when we wrote an article on rate of force development, right? So I wrote it together with Bas van Hoor and he did all the dirty work. I take all the credits, as it usually is, but uh, he actually, he's done a lot of good work there. And um, if you look at what's what's out there in classic strength training literature, right, it says that, that uh, high uh, resistance um, ballistic training is very good for rate of force development, right? Now, what I said to Bart, to Bart said, listen, you have to look to all the articles you can find on uh, rate of force development and training, right? And what you have to look at is um, what resistance did they use to measure rate of force development against? Do you think traditional strength training negatively influences peripheral motor control? Um, yes, it does, because um, one thing you don't need in traditional strength training is co-contractions, uh, co right? Uh, because uh, it's the muscle against the, the resistance, and that is where the, the equilibrium uh, comes from. Where if you look in uh, explosive sports, uh, the peripheral motor control is based on uh, properties of muscles, but they need to be activated, and that can only be activated by co-contractions prior to uh, they are, the moment they have to correct things. So if I run, I have typically swing leg retraction. In that swing leg retraction, I build up the tension in all the muscles. And then when the ground hits the foot, then these muscles can correct uh, errors, and that's peripheral control. And can you explain the difference between attractors and, and fluctuators? I know that's something that you've mentioned before, and perhaps in the context of Australian rules football, uh, if possible, or, or, or a field-based sport, team-based field-based sport. Yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about AFL a little bit. Um, so if you take AFL, right, it's mayhem. It's basically two packs of dogs trying to rip each other apart, right, without much structure in it, almost. So if you have that, then you have a very complex uh, environment, right? And if you look at the body, it's also very complex. We have a very complex body and a very complex environment. If you combine those two, you're not capable of controlling it anymore. It's too complicated, right? So there's one thing you can do is make your body simpler, right? So where you have 150 joints that can move in all directions, make sure 140 are uh, joints that you don't need to control. And you do that by co-contracting. So a joint gets into its sweet spot and stays there because all the muscles are interacting with each other and you find that sweet spot where you, your joint is strongest, right? And those are almost uh, self-stabilizing uh, components of movement. And those self-stabilizing components of movement are called attractors. And why do you think ACLs are so prevalent these days in field uh, and court sports like your, your AFL soccer, NFL? Uh, I think, uh, so if, if you're interested in female soccer, it's been now a bigger issue, right? A lot of discussion mm -hmm. about it. 
and uh, they gave all kinds of reasons and one of the reasons is also oil coordination but if you look at uh after we've been looking at all virtually all non-contact acl injuries and they're all the same it's always the same movement pattern that goes wrong so what you have if you're on the field you have face transitions one organization principle and then you jump to another organization principle that could be acceleration to deceleration could be acceleration to a sidestep and, so, and and so on right uh, and if people are not capable of making very clean transitions from one organization principle to the next organization principle they end up in a position where self-protection is not possible and that's where the acls happens